looking at the budget that we had, knowing that we had this huge deficit, we were going to have to go over a three-quarter vote, and ensuring that all members felt fairly, which meant the minority members also, in, including the minority members. And that was, that was one of our priorities, and, and we did our best to try and do that. Um, this time around, you know, our voices weren't, weren't part of that, and I think it's going to weaken the system as a whole because they don't have the voice of all the legislators in, in this budget. Becky Bohr at the Associated Press. Um, it seems like um, some of you are characterizing the permanent fund amendment as a surprise, but the governor proposed a lot of the same things in his budget, and it's outlined in the governor's overview from Ledge Finance. So I, I'm wondering, is it is the main objection then the CBR aspect? Is it, 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 because this didn't seem to come out of left field, it was something that was already in the budget. And then secondly, I'm interested in um, one of the caucus priorities that the minority leader mentioned last month was protecting the dividend. Has there been any consensus within your caucus as to what exactly that means at this point, and is there support for a draw of some kind as part of a fiscal package? Thanks, Becky. So first and foremost, I did, I did see that in the governor's plan, and I can tell you I didn't agree with the governor's plan. I don't think anybody in our caucus agreed with what the governor had proposed as a budget. So from that starting point, um, that was just a non-starter for us on the way he approached his, uh, his budget. He left an $800 million gap in his budget, and he said he had a fully funded budget, um, which is a little disingenuous. But when you have a, a caucus and you have, uh, you're the majority, you have a great responsibility to craft something, um, and you do it in the shroud of darkness. Um, and you bring it to the table without telling your finance members, without having a conversation with those folks. Um, there's 18 of us. Uh, that's that's a large that's a large group of people that are sitting on the house floor, sharing in not only the solution but facing a, facing tough questions. Uh, so I was a little disappointed that uh, Representative Seaton, um, before he looks at doing anything to reduce the size of government, he's going to be taking money from my constituents' pockets. On the issue of the permanent fund, have we come to an agreement? We are still looking at the, the proposals, the policy proposals, which should be a policy proposal, not a uh, drafted in the dark of night budget amendment that creates a policy in its own in a budget bill. We feel that, that um, those discussions should happen committee. Uh, we should have uh, committee conversations, whether it's SB 21, whether it's SB 70. Those things should take place in an open format where we can discuss the, the pros and cons of doing an earnings reserve draw or restructuring a PFD. Those are policy positions that we should have conversations about. Representative Pruitt, I know you wanted to follow up. Um, yeah, and actually, I'll, I'll agree with the uh, with Representative Millett on this. the The difference in in terms of how the governor's handled is this was out of nowhere again. The subcommittee of one decided that this was without any kind of meetings, without any public set of hearings, without any public discussion. Decided that he was going to introduce an amendment, and so the first time we had a, even a discussion on this concept, which is very similar to like you said to what the governor had was when there was an amendment in front of us to alter in a, a slight manner the way the governor had offered it up. And then to add on to that, at least the governor had recognized that to be able to move forward on an, an agenda like this, you have to have the buy-in of the vast majority of the people representing the majority of the public. And their decision to then turn around and say, we don't want to include the majority of the people representing the majority of the public that we're just going to do it with the small group that we've got. That doesn't mean that you're moving forward in a, an inclusive manner that, is the, that has the best uh, mindset of the public in place. So again, I'll remind you, this was a subcommittee of one without public discussion, without any conversation about what he, the governor had even had proposed, because we had not talked about it. We hadn't even talked about what he had proposed. All of a sudden, it was just out in an amendment. That's not how you do this. If you're the new transparent group out there, that's not transparent in any way, shape, or form. Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, do you have a sense as to what you would ask for in negotiations over the CBR and what you would ask the Senate to focus on in their negotiations with the House majority if this was to uh, move forward? 
Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think, you know, I think our focus has been to uh, make sure we right size government before we ask people to either give up their permit fund checks or uh, institute an income tax. Um, if you look at what um, came out of House Finance yesterday, they're actually increasing the budget. I don't think in the time, fiscal times that we're in that anybody, any of our constituents would agree that increasing the size of government is something we should be doing right now. Um, for me, uh, it indicates that uh, that the new Democrat majority is happy with the size of government and they're willing to leave the level where it's at and take money from your pocket and my pocket, and I'm not comfortable with that. I think uh, that's the easy, lazy way out of just saying government is the right size and we're just going to start taking your money and taking your PFT. I think we have to have an honest conversation about what size of government do we want. And we heard it loud and clear when we were back in Anchorage that there is still room to cut the budget. Um, smart, smart reductions. Uh, there's things that we can do um, in, as a legislature to make sure that there's not redundancy, that we're protecting folks. Um, in a way that uh, the, our economy is strong. You're looking at a bunch of business people sitting up here that have done business and had private sector jobs that understand that when your revenue falls 60%, your budget should fall. Um, you know, every household understands that common theory, and you, I have not seen that happen. Anybody else? Um. I would agree with that. I think the <clears throat> the real challenge is, is uh, the process. And for those of us, I think 15, 15 new members in the body. Uh, and I think the, the interesting thing about the House is uh, every member has to run every two years. So there's 40 new House members uh, here, or 40 House members that have actually run and been you know, nose to nose with their constituents in the district. Uh, you know, to your point on on you know, how, how it should work. Uh, I, I'm used to a kind of a committee process where you put issues up and you have a vote on it. Uh, under the, the new mechanism or new scheme, uh, there's really, they didn't have votes in the finance subcommittees. Uh, uh, and I think that that, uh, I think that that kind of lessens the ability of, of, you know, for the discussion and the debate that really needs to happen. Uh, for my preference, I would like to see another 250 to 300 million dollars reduced out of the budget. Uh, I think that's always good to have that over time. Uh, I think the, uh, there need to be structural changes. We need to, you know, we've got a huge budget hole and, uh, you know, there's a, many of us are ready to step up to the plate and, and fix it, but we need to see some structural changes. And I think if you just put more money into the equation, you add more, you, you basically start raiding the, the earnings reserve of the permanent fund uh, before you make some of those hard choices, uh, then those hard choices aren't going to be made. Representative Johnst Johnston. Yes, actually, uh, Representative Birch raised a good point as far as structural changes, and I'm, I'm not somebody who feels you should just cut across the board as far as government, but I did get on the two committees, Education and, and Health and Social Services, and, and the reason I did is those are your two biggest drivers. And so how are we providing, and, and I look at, at the uh, preschool, the, the zero to five year olds and and I did something in education that caused great concern because I said let's cut the two million dollars in pre-k grants the reason I did that is I wanted to start the conversation we have for pre-k right now almost 39 million dollars in head start and totally within the education department over 39 million dollars in Hess for that same population, you're spending over $121 million. And there, there's no coordination between those two departments and the clients they're serving. And, and I feel, you know, so you've got, you've got these people, and very good people working for the public out in the communities trying to do the best they can. And I think they all feel like they've got their finger in the dike. You know, they're, they're saving the world, but they don't have a dike around them. And, and this is the kind of conversations I want to have down here. How do we most efficiently, effectively be that public sector for the great state of Alaska? And just, just briefly, Sharice, that we've heard from the very beginning that all options are supposed to be on the table, and they're not, you know, along with the option of trying to reduce this budget. So reducing the budget, having all financial opportunities or funding sources on the table has been taken away within the first 45 days here, so that's that's certainly stifling the public's uh, opportunity. Thank you. Uh, 
Austin Baird from KTU. Um, Hillcorp has a significant amount of gas leaking into Cook Inlet, and the company says it won't be fixed indefinitely because of sea ice. Uh, how do you feel the state should respond, and do you think that this reveals any weaknesses in environmental regulations or perhaps risks of drilling in areas that have sea ice? Yeah, I, you know, I, I follow that, and I, I think the first and foremost consider, consideration has to be public safety. I mean, I think there's, uh, there's a widespread interest and uh, concern uh, voiced uh, in the area, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, my assumption would be that the, that the, the State Department uh, that regulates that area is, 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 is closely focusing on it. I have heard some, some problems with the, uh, you know, being able to engage in that repair in the winter. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, from a, a personal standpoint, Point, I think that uh, public safety has got to be the number one concern there. And I'll just point out that um, while I, I believe that Representative Birch is correct on that, you know, we had legacy wells up on the North Slope that were leaking gas for 30 years. So, um, you know, we need, to, we need to pay attention to these issues. These issues are very important. And so I, I also have been following issues, and I have some constituents that had some deep concerns about it. And I've um, reached out to DEC and um, some other state regulatory agencies to find out what their solutions are. And right now, um, as, it, as it is, it's a challenge to, to repair the, the gas as, it, as it's being uh, leaked from the pipe. So I think we, it does expose us to some issues that we need to look at. Um, Steve Quinn with Bloomberg, in the context of the taxes, you know, this is the fourth year in a row we've heard about government's too big. Um, so maybe it's because I live in Juneau, but I'm hearing a lot of people say, do the Republicans want to put me out of work? Um, you know, when does government no longer too big? Yeah, I don't have a problem answering that. Um, you know, to your point, there's a lot of people that have felt that uh, in the last few years, we haven't done enough. If I go back to some of my constituents. And so we've had to be, but I feel that in the last few years, we've been very tempered and tried to be very, um, uh, we, haven't, we haven't just gone and slashed things. And um, so it's a measured approach that we've taken. And we have asked people uh, to, we have asked for jobs to be reduced, and if you've noticed, most of those have been reduced through attrition. Uh, we haven't just gone out there and slashed everything. We've been very cautious about it. The goal isn't to sit here and fire a bunch of people, although I will admit, when people are losing their jobs, when people are seeing reductions of substantial amounts to their pay, they're asking us why we continue to allow everyone across the board in state government to continue to get raises. And that's an appropriate conversation that they're having. They're saying, you're going to tax me. You're going to go ahead and take my permanent fund. You're going to reduce the amount of money in my pocket when I'm already seeing a reduction because the economy is not there. Why are you continuing to give other people raises? We're creating a have and a have not situation. So the goal here isn't to just let people go. The goal here is to truly help them keep their jobs by being appropriate and managing the situation. But what has happened over the last couple of years? Anytime we broach the conversation about freezing pay, Anytime we've, some of these times when we've had conversations about, uh, about uh, um, offering for furloughs, you get like the nastiest emails in the world. And so it's a balance of both managing it in terms of continuing to make uh, a very careful adjustments to government, which is I th think what you're going to find we will be offering in the next few days from our side, not just slashing government, not just taking a big huge hatchet to it, but taking that scalpel and trying to figure out where we're not being efficient, where we've got money going, and sometimes it's not even state workers. These are, these are th th there's money flowing outside of state government that nece shouldn't necessarily be there. So I, I think to answer your question, we are stepping up and asking to manage the situation. We've been managing it for the last couple of years with a reduction that's been uh, not an immediate slashing of everything, but carefully uh, uh, approaching, the, approaching the size of government with the reductions that take time. M mind you, we increased it quickly. We've been very cautious in reducing it slowly. And that's what we're asking for it to continue. We know that there's opportunities out there still. And we've got, we've got some great ideas that have come from our minority members. And uh, we have to con be considerate of, of all of the users at this point in time. 
Representative Johnson. As far as Rep Representative Pruitt's thought on attrition, um, I'm not sure how old you are, but I am a baby boomer. And as a generation, we are retiring at a time when technology is changing quickly. And um, um, it's a great opportunity of, again, how to do things more efficiently and effectively. I had a great conversation with a state worker the other night who had taken over from a baby boomer. And this person, I would say, would maybe be 30 or so. And I said, um, I bet you're making a lot of changes. And, and this person said, yes. Um, um, when I got here, it was on a mainframe, which if you know anything about computers, that's about the most inefficient way you could be doing things. And I said, was there anything being done by paper? And she said, yes. And um, have you cut down a lot of processes? And she said, yes. This is the opportunities we have, and if we don't take those opportunities, then we're going to we're going to be promoting a culture that really does not respect the people that are in the position and doesn't allow them to do their work effectively and do it as well as they could be doing it. Representative, Steve, just just briefly, Steve, you asked how we're going to know when we're at the right size government, and I look back at investments in this state, and quite frankly. If you had, I'll just, I'll just summarize it this way. If you had to hire a plumber, it's easily $100 an hour. Well, he doesn't make $100 an hour. He might make 30 as a skilled craftsman. The company that he works for might make 15 or $20 an hour to, to cover their investments of $100,000 of dollars. So we have companies and businesses in the state. And it costs $50 an hour to, to take care of all the government services. When I start seeing changes in how our economy is run in the business environment in the state, we'll know we're at the right size. Yeah. And with that, we've hit the 930 mark. Um, stay safe out there. It looks like there's a little winter bl blizzard happening. So um, we'll be around take questions afterwards. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next Thursday with a whole new group of people.